to the Tenable Network Security webcast, Five Things You're Not Doing with Your Vulnerability Scanner. Today, if you have any questions, please, please place them in the Q&A panel and they will be addressed at the end of the conference. Thank you. I would now like to turn the call over to your host, Mr. Paul Asadorian, Product Marketing Manager for Nessus. Thank you. A uh, very important piece of housekeeping. Can everyone hear me? If you can, go ahead and type right into that chat window. And uh, oh, yes, people can hear me. That's great. We are starting off on a good note. Welcome. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, again, I'm Paul Asadorian, the Product Marketing Manager for the Nessus family of products. I also have with me here today uh, Mr. Jack Daniel, who will be helping moderate questions. Welcome, Jack. Thank you very much. Good to be with you, Paul. So I wanted to start off today by talking about some blind spots in your network. And one of the things we talk about uh, a lot here at Tenable is how we assist our customers in identifying those blind spots in your network and pulling out the information that you may not realize uh, was there or hosts you may not realize was there, applications, vulnerabilities. Um, so there are lots of blind spots in your network, which again could be assets that you maybe don't look about, uh, look at, know about, exposures you're maybe not looking for, and gaps in protections uh, on the endpoint, such as antivirus, for example. So we'll touch on these topics, and that'll be kind of the, the underlying theme for this presentation is not just things you might not be doing with your vulnerability scanner, but areas inside of your network or outside of your network, as is the case with cloud, where you may have some blind spots and need to know some additional information that may force you to change the way you do security in your organization. It may, you may have a different conversation with your systems administrators. You may adjust your security processes and procedures. Um, and of course, a lot of these blind spots are the things that lead to breaches. Of course, everyone has probably caught wind of the Home Depot breach, which happened recently. We got a little more information about this, that it was in fact a security breach. Um, some of the other breaches that I was you know, pulling from uh, that happened recently um, were you know, breaches that we can trace back to the Heartbleed vulnerability, which I thought was kind of interesting, um, where over 4 million patient name social security numbers from a healthcare organization were leaked, uh, and that again was traced back to the Heartbleed vulnerability. If you look through our archives, you can find an entire webcast on the Heartbleed vulnerability. And those are just some of the things that you can do with your vulnerability scanner to identify these vulnerabilities before they lead to a breach. And of course, malware is very closely associated with breaches today. So um, some of the retail chains recently have been targeted by these breaches, right? Super Value, the UPS store, uh, Home Depot being the most recent example. Um, I actually did a about a 30 to 40 minute podcast uh, with Jeff Mann, uh, who works for Tenable as the PCI evangelist and Brandon Williams, a PCI expert, and we talked a lot about how malware is uh, infecting these retail locations. And primarily, from what I talk with the experts and I read about um, online, is that these retail point of sale systems are increasingly becoming the targets. A lot of these systems are running Windows XP, which as you all know has been end of life. A lot of these systems are targeted with specific malware that's infecting these point of, system, uh, point of sale system terminals and collecting the credit card uh, information as it comes across, doing things like memory scraping, getting around all of the protections that we've put in place in order to collect credit card information. So, you know, this is what, so what brings to mind when I think of this slide is, right, well, you've got malware on your system. Well, you know, what's missing in your security program that's leading to malware coming on these systems. Now, some of it might be process and procedure related, right? I've got 20,000 stores, they've all got 15 cash registers, and they're all running Windows XP. I can't just snap my fingers or sprinkle some magic pixie dust and expect that exposure or that in associated threats to just go away. Um, you know, I understand that. There are other situations where there are systems in place for these point of sale devices well, we can help uh, detect and prevent some of these things from happening, right? We can help identify missing patches, configuration, 
um, all of which is abused by, you know, those things are missing. Malware is going to abuse that and get installed on your system. So there's just some examples here of uh, malware leading to breaches as well, which is a common theme that we're seeing. Just a very quick product feature comparison for everyone out there. As our product portfolio has changed in the past few months, I wanted everyone to kind of get a glimpse before we talked about some more of the problems um, that you may have in your organization and how some of our products can help you with that. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about Nessus. <coughs> Excuse me. I'll talk a little bit about Nessus. Nessus is targeted at individuals. You can scan an unlimited number of IP addresses. It contains uh, the features which allow you to scan things like mobile environments, virtual environments, and do compliance checks. It's primarily targeted at small organizations or consultants, right? I speak to a lot of penetration testers who very heavily use Nessus. They use Nessus in their penetration process as one of the probably primary tools that they're using in order to set the stage for the other attacks that they might do. It's an extremely popular tool for that purpose um, and is a valuable tool to a lot of penetration testers and, of course, small organizations as well. Primarily, that's offered on-premise. <clears throat> the relatively new product that we're offering is Nessus Enterprise. It's targeted at teams. You can share and collaborate. You can share scanners, scan results, reports with other individuals and teams inside of your organization, alleviating some of the burden on the IT security department to be able to do all of this scanning. It also can scan an unlimited number of IP addresses and offers the multiple users and resource sharing. It isn't targeted, targeted at larger organizations. It's offered on-premise, and there is a cloud version. So if you don't want to host Nessus inside of your organization, we have a cloud service which hosts that and also offers PCI uh, ASV scanning. Our enterprise product is Security Center. Uh, it offers an unlimited number of scanners. You can have as many Nessus scanners as you want. The big differentiators are asset management, dashboards, enterprise reporting, and trending of all of your vulnerabilities. I was just speaking to a Security Center customer who's doing some amazing things with the product. They're producing reports both for management, for their systems administrators, and using it to leverage security uh, and really enable the security process in their environment. It's targeted at enterprise deployments, and you can use that on-premise or and also integrate uh, our cloud scanner in it, into Security Center as well. Okay, we also have the passive vulnerability scanner, which allows you to discover the assets you don't know about by sniffing traffic on your network. One of the things that it can do is detect inappropriate relationships, which systems are talking to which systems on which protocols, as well as detecting vulnerabilities that may have a tendency to hide inside of your network. Maybe there are systems with running older web browsers, which you can't identify because you're not able to gain access to those resources or they've fallen off your patch management cycle, uh, the passive vulnerability scanner can detect all of those and more, as well as cloud applications and other things. Um, I do want to put up the um, polling question at this time. Uh, I've prepared three short polls uh, that will be up for about a minute. This one's which vulnerability management product are you using today? If you could be so kind as to very quickly answer that poll, um, that would be very, very helpful to us. Okay, so now that we have a, a brief understanding uh, and an overview of Tenable products, I wanted to talk about the five things that I find most people are not doing. Um, I talk to a lot of different organizations in a lot of different settings in all sorts of different industries, customers that use our products, penetration testers that on any given month they see three or four or more different kinds of networks, and I talk to them about <clears throat> the problems that people might be having. The first one is virtualization. Right? You've got all of these systems that are virtual. You can create new systems very quickly, and how do you do auditing and patch management inside of those environments? The other is, of course, malware and botnet detection that goes beyond antivirus. So as we all know, antivirus isn't perfect. Um, there's malware that slips past antivirus. Um, there's uh, you know, the Home Depot malware was you know, reported in the press as saying not discoverable by any common or modern antivirus software. Um, whether that's true or not is, I think, remains to be seen, yet to be seen. But um, there are gaps in your antivirus programs, um, and we can help with that as well. 
your mobile devices, right? Everyone probably was watching. If you're a nerd like me in the background, I've got the Apple announcement, which just happened uh, from 1 to 2 p.m. today. If you were tuned into that, right, you're going to see all these new products come out from Apple, and everyone in your organization, well, who's an Apple fan, is going to want, you know, a new phone, a new gadget. Everyone travels with a tablet, a smartphone, um, and all of these different kinds of mobile devices. And how do you do the vulnerability auditing you need to do to maintain compliance with your own policies inside of that? So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about patch management, extremely important in integration with your vulnerability scanners. It's one thing to go discover the missing patches in your environment. It's a whole other level to integrate that with your patch management programs, such as SCCM or other technologies, and be able to draw upon other sources of information to give you a clear picture of which patches are missing in your environment. Of course, cloud hosting and cloud applications are extremely popular now. Um, I, there are this whole transformation has gone to like a whole new level, right? You can have entire organizations now that have very little in the way of systems inside their organization. All of their technology, or almost all of it, can be hosted out in the cloud. Their email, their sales force, um, sharing files on Dropbox, what have you. It, you know, all of their servers could be hosted in Amazon EC2. So how do you take your vulnerability management program and transform it into being able to identify vulnerabilities in these new technologies? Okay, the first problem that relates primarily to virtualization is the way in which new systems are rolled out in your environment. With just a few clicks, I can roll out a new system, and lo and behold, it's on the network. Entire ecosystems can be created overnight. Building a brand new virtualization environment is not all that difficult. Provided you have the hardware in place, you can stand up 10 or 20 or more systems basically overnight. This leads to a larger and more dynamic attack surface than ever before, right? There's two problems. There's the one of sprawl, right? I have more systems that I need to defend because people can just create them by clicking a few buttons. I've got the whack-a-mole problem where systems come up, they're used for a specific amount of time, and then they're shut down. And then maybe three months later, they're brought back up again. But who's applying patches to those? Who's doing the systems configuration management on those systems that are kind of transient on your network? So you're playing this whack-a-mole problem. How often am I scanning? Which systems am I picking up on when I'm running the scan? Um, so this becomes a, a serious problem for a lot of organizations. Catching 100% of your malware with antivirus is a losing battle. You know, I, I speak to a lot of penetration testers, and um, they all have their own bag of tricks as to how they get around antivirus, right? I mean, at the end of the day, one of the things the penetration tester has to show is persistence in the network, right? If an attacker were to compromise a system, how persistent could they be within the network? How long before you discover that person? Um, how long is that time period is very, very important, right? Some of these breaches, Home Depot, for example, we can date some of them back to the spring, right? You may not be able to defend against every possible scenario of someone getting into your network, right? But the quicker you can identify someone, the uh, less likely the damage will be down the road. So being able to catch more malware sooner is extremely important especially if you're in the retail industry, if you're in the industrial control systems or have SCADA devices on your network, it's extremely important as the bad guys are targeting you, right? What we've seen in the press recently, recently as the past year, right, is an increase in the number of attacks against retailers and against the industrial control systems as well. So this is a big problem, and I think that by uh, looking at some of the behavior of your systems, which I'll show you, looking at the processes, and looking at some new and unique ways in which to approach the malware problem, you'll be able to be more effective in this area. Um, you know, mobile brings up a lot of different blind spots, right? It removes a lot of the control that IT has over your device. And while there are some systems, mobile device managers or MDMs that can help you gain some of that control back, at the end of the day, you really don't have control over what devices people are using to access the resources inside of your organization. You know, a great example is access to email. If you allow anyone to put that active sync software on their phones or, or tablets and access the resources in your organization, 
now you don't have really have control over that device. And sure, you can enforce standards, um, which help, but I think there's always going to be those outliers that make you concerned about data security, right? Now we have to be a little more concerned about the physical security of the device. It's a lot easier to lose than a laptop, although stolen laptops still remain up there. Um, and those devices contain data. So you need a whole new strategy to help protect your mobile devices. And these devices don't just have one way of communicating, right? A lot of these devices have 3G, 4G, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, NFC, all of which as you pay attention to conferences like Black Hat, a lot of these communications protocols and technologies that have been proven to have insecurities. Now, we may not see the NFC um, standard, for example, be exploited. However, there was a presentation like a year ago at Black Hat that that happened. But that usually is a precursor of things to come. And now, with the Apple announcement that we had just today, we found the new iPhone supporting NFC. So this could be something that is uh, potentially worrisome, and you need to get a handle on the vulnerabilities that are associated with mobile devices and configurations inside of your organization. And uh, I'll show you some tricks um, that we have up our sleeve that can help you with that problem. Vulnerabilities hide. It was interesting. I, I wrote a blog post several years ago about how patches tend to fall off, right? And there's lots of different scenarios on how patches fall off. Your systems administrators will say, I patch, you know, Tuesday comes, Microsoft Tuesday comes around, and I apply all those patches. And until you're going in and making sure that's happening, you may not realize all those different scenarios that lead to a patch to become missing. Maybe a system was restored from backup, and that patch was never reapplied. Maybe the patch was sent down to the system, but for whatever reason, that system was never rebooted. Maybe that system wasn't turned on when you were applying patches and has fallen out of your patch management cycle. Maybe you've added a whole new host or new divisions or you've merged with another company and now you've got all these new hosts to worry about that aren't participating in your awesome patch management program. So there's a lot of different scenarios that lead to patches falling off and this is where vulnerabilities can hide. You may not see that on your consoles, you may not see that in your patch management systems, but when you audit that, with your security processes, such as vulnerability management, that's when you'll be able to see this stuff happen. Um, applications are another thing, too. You know, I, I think the OpenSSO vulnerability is a great example of how a vulnerability can hide. That vulnerability can be packaged in with other software. It can be installed through your Linux uh, distributions software uh, distribution mechanism packages. It can be installed from source. There's lots of different ways this can creep in in your environment and bypass your processes for good systems administration. And that's why, one reason why you need an external process such as vulnerability management to help validate those findings and validate what you have on the system and identify those things that may have fallen outside of your current processes and procedures. External platforms are becoming more and more of a hot topic, right? Now, a lot of organizations are moving entire server farms into the cloud. And why not, right? There's a significant cost reduction in doing that. The technology is evolving. The APIs for these technologies in, in the cloud are simply amazing. The things that you can do um, that just break the mold of traditional IT, um, creating servers on the fly, scripting servers being you know, created, um, all of that is awesome, awesome technology. However, it's now an entire new ecosystem, separate from your virtualization, but an entire new ecosystem that's sitting outside of your organization that has its own configuration. Um, and then couple that with not just hosting your servers in the cloud, right, but your applications that now live in the cloud, like Salesforce and Dropbox. And um, I use a lot of collaboration suites, Smartsheet and Jive and Google Documents. All of those are outside of it. And how do you get a handle on who's using which technology and what security controls you have in place for those using these cloud applications? So we'll talk about some tips for dealing with that as well. Okay, so let's talk about some solutions. Uh, on the virtual side, Nessus detects virtualization and provides audits for virtualization patches and configuration. Now, one of the things that, that Nessus has the capability of doing is looking inside of your virtual environment 
and pulling out information about which systems are inside of your virtual ecosystem, what operating systems they're running, what IP addresses they may have, and giving you an inventory. Uh, it, it's very interesting. You know, PVS also can detect new instances of entirely new virtual platforms. Let's say you've got a division that's in a remote office, and they decide one day without checking with IT, right, because everyone always checks with IT before they deploy a new technology, right? Um, they decide to put up an entirely new virtual platform that you're not aware of, so you're not auditing that for patches and configuration uh, and taking an inventory of which systems are on there. So that's where the passive vulnerability scanner can come in and say, hey, I'm looking at the traffic, and there was a server there, and it's running you know, VMware, and someone has put up this whole new ecosystem, um, and, and it can alert you of that because it's sniffing the network. So you, it tells you about the things you don't know about. But for the things that you do know about, of course, you've got Nessus and the ability to do um, the audit. Um, so here's just one example of a compliance summary. So Nessus is logged into a virtual you know, this, a vCenter or vSphere instance. It's pulled out all of the compliance issues. So this is how you've configured your virtualization infrastructure. You know, have you disabled SSH? Have you enabled remote syslogging? And you can tune and customize these standards in accordance with your own security policies and keep tabs on how your infrastructure is configured and keep things hardened and secure using Nest. Okay, this is the one that uh, I was really excited about. I was actually talking to uh, a security center customer the other day. And we were talking about how, you know, they're moving from one cloud infrastructure to another and how they really, really like the, the features that we provide in Nessus. And I said, well, you know, how are you using it? He said, well, you know, we run a scan every day and we pull out an inventory of all of the systems that are running and have been created on there. And then we go to the developers or the systems administrators and we say, you know, yesterday you, or last week you spun up three new virtual systems. Do you really need three? And they use it as a cost control measure to make sure that they're not spinning up more virtual systems than they need because every one that you spin up in a cloud provider has an impact on cost. Um, so they're using it as a cost control measure, which I thought was really, really cool and a great use case for it. Of course, on the security side, you want to know about new platforms and new systems that are coming up on your network that can otherwise have a tendency to hide. So by auditing the infrastructure itself, it doesn't matter whether these virtual systems are suspended or um, powered down or whether they're running, it's going to report on them. Um, it will tell you if a virtual machine exists and what operating system it has. If VMware tools are installed, it will give you the operating system and the IP address that that system is running on, which I just think is a great piece of functionality that lets you keep tabs on what's happening in your virtual environment. Uh, so this is a slightly more detailed audit. You can see in this test case, we have a lot more virtual systems running, um, and it tells you whether it's powered on or powered off, whether VMware tools is installed or not, the operating system, and again, the IP address if those VMware tools are installed. Okay, with respect to malware, Nessus does a whole heck of a lot with respect to malware. Um, it'll cross-reference running processes on your Windows host against known malware that it pulls from a third-party database. It also identifies suspicious processes and maintains lists of known good Windows processes. So rather than going out and trying to find a signature for the malware that may be running on your system, what Nessus can do, again using a third-party database, is tell you about all of the identified processes that are good, some of them that are known good, and then telling you about which ones work on that list. So it's kind of like a backwards approach to doing malware analysis and really get deep into the system to tell you about what's happening. Um, so here's an example. Oh, sorry. We're going to do a polling question. I totally I missed that. It is another polling question time. Uh, the question this time is about what the following Nessus features are you using most? So if you're using Nessus or uh, Nessus family of products, which ones are you using most? If you could fill out that poll, that would be fantastic. One of the nice things uh, about uh, Nessus with respect to malware is um, when you enable this check inside of Nessus, it's going to log into Windows hosts, for example. It's going to 
pulls a list of running processes. It's going to do an MD5 checksum of those processes. It's going to cross-reference that with a third-party database and report back any processes that are known to be malware or potentially unwanted software. And potentially unwanted software is usually a tool that can be used for evil or good, but most likely used for evil. And that's this example that we have here. And you can see it gives you a nice little report, and it says, hey, all of these antivirus vendors, they reported it as malware. Um, so 25 of them uh, out of the, I believe, 50 or so that we have uh, in, in conjunction with our third party, I've identified it as malware. It then gives you a link to get more information. And oh, by the way, the malware is also um, extracted from the system and attached to the Nessus report. So you have an offline copy of that malware that was found to be running on that system for you to do analysis on. So when you click this little link right here, it says, hey, for more information, you can go to our malware database and get a little more information about it. And it gives you a lot of great information that can help your forensics and incident response processes. It tells you all the different names and all the different antivirus vendors that found this as malware and what they call it. Because no two antivirus vendors call the same piece of malware the same name. I'm not sure I can help you fix that problem uh, other than giving you access to that stream. And like I said, this malware is attached to the report. So this is an example of um, a malicious process detected. Um, this was actually user-defined malware running. So I gave Nessus an MD5 string, and I said, hey, any process that you find running on Windows hosts that has this MD5 signature, I'm defining it as malware, so go find that all on all of my systems. Nessus will log in. It will actually take a copy of that malware, pull it out, and attach it to the report, as you can see here. Um, here's an example of good reputation. Um, so these processes were found as known good processes running on the Windows host. Again, giving you kind of that whitelist of here's what should be running on these hosts. Um, and their reputation, and again, we get this information from a third-party database. Based on that, we can develop a list of unknown processes, or processes that so-called maybe don't have a bad reputation, right? But they are unknown. They're not in the good list, so they might be suspicious and something you want to look at. Again, this greatly helps your forensics and incident response processes by having this information keeping this information collected, you know, not just maybe running it if there's a, an outbreak of malware in your environment, but run the scan on a regular basis, let it collect. That way, if there is an instance of malware that you want to look at, you can then go ahead and go back into your Nessus results and go, oh, I see that this process was not in the known good list, and this helps you identify some of the malware that may be on your system that doesn't have a signature that antivirus can pick up on, but because it wasn't in the known good list, you can get it flagged and receive that information from your Nessus results. Okay, mobile solutions. So Nessus supports a lot of different mobile device managers, um, which is easier to talk about first, right? Apple Profile Manager, Good for Enterprise, Mobile Iron, and AirWatch are all ones that we integrate with. So if you have those technologies, you can integrate the data that those systems collect with Nessus and identify hosts and vulnerabilities on those platforms. The one that I really, really love, which is super, super cool, is Nessus supports ActiveSync. So if you link Nessus to Active Directory and report on mobile device vulnerabilities, what's that, what that's doing is anytime a device, a tablet or phone, uses ActiveSync and connects to your domain, what you're going to see inside of Nessus is that phone's operating system and any associated vulnerabilities. So you don't have to use an MDM to collect this information. You don't need any other tools. As long as you have Active Directory and a copy of Nessus, it allows you to integrate those. And this is just a configuration screen to do that. And here are some examples of detecting mobile vulnerabilities. You can see we detected an iOS uh, 601, which has multiple vulnerabilities. Um, and you get to see all kinds of uh, information about that device, right? So what are people using to access our information in our organization? You see the serial number, the model and version, you know, what uh, operating system is running, uh, which user is using that. Um, this produces some great reports for management if they want to know, well, you know, what are people using in our environment in terms of mobile devices to access our information? You can use Nessus to collect that. If you have policies in place and you standardize on 
iPhone. And you say, everyone is going to use a standard iPhone. It's going to be configured with this software to add more protections to it. You can go in and see if anyone else is using different technology to connect your resources inside of your organization. Uh, and here are some more examples of iPhones and iPhone vulnerabilities. Um, you can see an iPhone wireless uh, detection was uh, wireless connection was detected, um, as well as vulnerabilities associated with that particular version of Apple iOS. And Jack, does that come from? Are these from Nessus or are these from PVS? I want to say these are from the passive vulnerability scanner. Um, so I should yeah these. Um yeah, the Apple uh, the connection detection is PVS. So it's a it's a good example. If you've got the passive vulnerability scanner, it doesn't need to sit on your wireless network as long as it's seeing the resulting traffic from your wireless network, such as internet connections, right? It will identify and say, hey, on your wireless network, you have iPhones. Um, and it has these associated vulnerabilities as well. So this is an example of how the passive vulnerability scanner can give you insights into your mobile platform, or which mobile platforms are in use. So vulnerabilities, um, you know, everyone, uh, I think, kind of gravitates towards when I say vulnerability management. Maybe not towards some of the other topics I've touched on, but you know, thinks a lot of relating it to patch management. And one of the ways in which I think Nessus has been very effective and, and differentiated in the market is its integration with patch management systems. Again, pulling that information from your patch management system pull it with, and merging it with the information from Nessus, what do those two systems know about patches on my host? And this can really help your troubleshooting process. It can really help build good relationships with your systems administrators. You're working with them to say, not what you may have said in the past is, well, Nessus found all these vulnerabilities. You need to go fix them. And then they come back and say, well, my patch management system says those things are patched, so I don't know what you're talking about. Now Nessus can collect data from both of those uh, and allow you to work together in order to identify the real vulnerabilities that are missing and do some troubleshooting as to why patches may be falling off the system. Now, of course, some of the other feedback you may get from your systems administrators is, well, I did a NASA scan of all 20,000 of your Windows systems. Here you go. Here's your report. Have a nice day fixing all of those vulnerabilities. Um, of course, we, in the reporting section of Nessus, we do have a remediations tab, right, which breaks down some of those vulnerabilities um, and rolls up a nice report. So what it will say is, for example, if you've got an OpenSSH server running and it's a really old version, in the straight results, Nessus will report on all 173 vulnerabilities that exist between OpenSSH 1.0 and OpenSSH 6.2. In the remediation summary, there's going to be one line that says upgrade all of your OpenSSH services to OpenSSH 6.2 and give you some information about how many vulnerabilities that will actually fix and how many hosts are affected by that vulnerability. So it's a, a summary report that's really, really nice to share with your systems administrators, and it's really the information that they need to know. If they need the details, they can always go in and get all of those details as well, but this remediation summary is a nice one to use with your systems administrators. On patch management, again, integrating with uh, another product. So um, you can see in this report, Nessus has scanned a host. It also has a integration with IBM's um, endpoint management system, and it has integration with WSUS. And it's come back and said, this host is um, found not to be vulnerable by your uh, IBM uh, endpoint manager and WSUS. So it prints you on a little report. Um, it then may say, well, Nessus has found that this has not been patched, uh, which is actually exactly what it's saying in this report. So this particular executable has not been patched, but your two patch managers think that it is. So this is a problem. And this is some, uh, an, an excellent example of how it can help you do that troubleshooting um, for your patch management system. Um, 
I think this was supposed to be in a different spot. Um, oh, no, I'm sorry. This is the passive vulnerability scanner um, and its ability to detect vulnerability. So uh, kind of transitioning from integrating with their patch management system uh, and talking about how the passive scanner can help detect vulnerabilities. Some of these client-side vulnerabilities are extremely difficult to detect, right? You need to have a credentialed scan. You need to make sure that um, it's configured properly. You need to make sure those hosts are actually on when you're doing that um, assessment. With the passive scanner, it can sit and listen to the traffic and say, hey, those hosts that are sending traffic right now are vulnerable to um, exploit the, a targeting in Adobe Flash Player and list the hosts that are doing that. So it's a great way to gain insight into your client-side vulnerabilities. Those clients can be on your wired network, they can be on your wireless network, it doesn't matter. As long as PVS can see the traffic, those hosts will likely eventually send traffic that will indicate the version of Adobe Flash Player that's installed on those hosts and will flag vulnerabilities. This is a fantastic way to gain insight into a lot of those client side vulnerabilities. And you can see some uh, vulnerability, other vulnerabilities in Firefox, in Safari, uh, in other client side uh, applications. Okay, with solutions on the cloud, Nessus now integrates with Amazon EC2. We are, in fact, the only pre authorized scanning vendor. Um, now, <clears throat> what that means is you can take Nessus or Nessus Enterprise and install it inside of your Amazon EC2 cloud. Um, you can then run native scans inside of EC2. Avoid those block scans. If you've got a large EC2 instance and you're trying to scan it from somewhere else, you may get some notifications from Amazon that say, hey, that's not cool. By Using the approved um, technology that we have that integrates with Amazon EC2, you can do that from within EC2 itself. You can scan all of your Amazon uh, servers from inside of your own cloud. Um, the other nice thing, too, is that configuration audits exist for EC2 itself. <clears throat> Some of you may remember earlier that I said, you know, you have to be conscious of your, <coughs> excuse me, you have to be very conscious of the configuration of your cloud provider, that this is an entire ecosystem that's a platform of itself, and it has its own firewall rules, its own security settings, its own administration settings, its own authentication. And how do you know that all of those things are secure and compliant with your policies? If you use Nessus, you give Nessus credentials to your EC2 instance, and Nessus can audit the configuration of your EC2 instance and allow you to harden that just as you would any other platform inside of your environment. And I'll also show some examples of PVS um, detecting cloud applications as well. Um, so here's just a, a, a little kind of uh, insight into some of the things that Nessus can do. Not only can it audit your EC2 instance, but it can also audit your <clears throat> if you're using Linux, uh, the Linux, Amazon Linux AMI is a specific flavor of Linux that Amazon developed. We can perform local security checks against that instance as well. And uh, of course, you know, the passive vulnerability scanner and its ability to detect cloud applications. As I mentioned before, you know, you might have Salesforce, you might have Dropbox, or any number of cloud applications, and are they approved? by the IT department for use in your environment? Are they configured properly? Um, are, you know, are they being used in accordance with your policy? All of these are possible to detect uh, using the passive vulnerability scanner as it's mo you know, monitoring all that traffic going out. It's detecting when Dropbox client software is in use. Maybe that's a violation of your policies. The passive vulnerability scanner can tell you that. It's also polling question time. To put up the final polling question for this webcast, if you could kindly uh, describe for us why you're not using more of the features, if you weren't using some of the features before, what are some of the reasons why uh, you might not be using some of the newer features that we're providing? Um, I want to tell you a little bit about Tenable Resources. You can visit our blog, listen to our regular podcast. Um, we've got many videos on our YouTube channel. Uh, visit our <coughs> discussions portal, especially if you're an existing customer. It's a great place to ask, ask questions and get more information. And of course, if you'd like to try 
or buy Nessus products, training, or bundles, you can go to our store or follow the link that's here on the, on the slide. Uh, and, you know, we're happy to help you with that. And at this time, Jack, are there questions from the audience? Yeah, there are uh, a handful of, uh, of great questions. Let's uh, kind of roll back. And um, Thaddeus had asked if uh, Nessus was able to do um, what he calls true mobility scanning. And he's just looking for a, an explanation of how we scan mobile devices. Are we hitting the device itself and services and, and how we do that? And, yeah, elaborate a bit. I, I think you covered that a bit after he asked it uh, with the mobile device and particularly with uh, Active Directory. But do uh, you want to elaborate a bit? Yeah, Nessus really has the ability to collect information about mobile devices from all of those sources that I mentioned. Uh, you know, Active Directory being one, uh, AirWatch, um, and all of the others that are good uh, good for enterprise. So we integrate with those solutions, we pull the data they contain, and we analyze that data for vulnerabilities. So we, we never actually touch the end user device. We're relying on those data stores and the data that they contain in order to perform that vulnerability analysis. Yeah, and those devices, as most of you know, unless you've installed an agent or jailbroken it or something, they, they don't respond. So we have to get an angle uh, get an angle to hook into those, and as you right. did show, Paul, the PVS can help you find those uh, find those stray things in the network if you if they're connecting to your network. Uh, just get a place where you can do it. So the uh, next question, there's one on Security Center, and uh, Chris, tell you what, since uh, Security Center is more my realm, how about if you and I hmm. follow up afterwards? Um, the other one, let's see, we had one from Steve Swan asking if Nessus integrated with uh, Red Hat Satellite Service. And the answer there is absolutely. That was actually the first one of these that we, we coded up, and uh, we've been working with the, the folks at Red Hat for quite a while. Um, there's a question. Um, let's see, I'll make sure I'm not missing any. Oh, uh, from Chris Sellard. Where does the malware copy get stored, Paul, when you were talking about uh, us taking a look at Nessus digging into the systems and finding bad things? Um, Chris's question, where does the malware copy get stored? Uh, it's stored on the Nessus server in the results. <clears throat> and I, I'd have to double check. So I, you send me an email. My email address is paul at nessus.org. Nice and easy to remember, paul at nessus.org. Um, send me that question. I'll double check. I believe that you, when you export that report, and you use the Nessus DB format, which takes everything associated with that report, um, that it will, in fact, include any attachments, uh, which can include malware samples, uh, and it can also include any screenshots that were taken of web services, RDP, or VNC services as well. So it's actually stored on the Nessus server inside of the report. Uh, let's see, quick one, does PVS have unlimited IPs? The PVS is available in two different licensing models. Uh, one is as a subscription, the way you use uh, Nessus, or Nessus Enterprise, uh, and that is you have a standalone product, you install it, and it listens to traffic and you log into the UI, and that is an unlimited IP um, system. Um, it, you're looking at a point in time of that. It's real time anytime you jump in, but it's not doing trending or advanced reporting. Uh, in Security Center Continuous View, that's the complete bundle of Security Center and all the Nessus scanners you need, as well as all the PVS instances you need, plus the log engine and agents. In that model, it uh, follows the Security Center licensing model. So it depends on what you need and, and how to do it. Um, a question from Mike Saldivar. Uh, Paul, does Nessus play well with case patch management and deployment? I believe we announced that, right? Yeah, that one's that one's a new one, okay. right? That was in the, yeah, in the so past couple of weeks. I had to question myself whether that was actually announced. But yeah, we did announce support uh, for an integration with Dell Case. If you check our blog, there is a write-up on our blog about the integration uh, with Dell Case. Oh, here here it is, right here. I can, if it lets me put 
a link in here, and if you trust a link, I'll put it in the, the general chat. Uh, there is a write-up on our integration support with Dell Case Systems. Um, what else do we want to take a look at? Uh, oh, here's here's a softball for you, Paul, uh, from Jim Dolan. How often does Tenable push out vulnerability updates to Nessus? Uh, every day. <laughs> yeah, uh, a couple fact, of times a day most days, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, you'll often see a lot of uh, plugins come out for the local security checks. Um, those are happening at a very rapid pace, basically. Any anytime a Linux software distribution um, pushes out a security update, we'll very quickly write a plugin for that. Um, and other plugins often come out once per day. There is an RSS feed that you can subscribe to, um, which will give you all of the uh, new plugins that are coming out. Okay, um, Stephen Fowler asks, I often get false positives where the scanner says something isn't patched um, and uh, you know XXX is the output, you should have YYY and the administrator can go in and show me YYY. Why does this happen? So um, false positives are a, um, that's a whole webinar in itself, but do you have some uh, quick answers for Stephen, uh, Paul? Yeah, you know, Microsoft isn't always very straightforward in uh, analyzing why certain things are patched, um, especially inside of their own patch management tools, um, and not everything's straightforward. So uh, one situation that could be occurring is if you got uh, that system and your Microsoft patch manager says this is patched and Nessus is saying this isn't patched, um, there could be another uh, copy of the DLL on the system that Nessus is finding that is not patched. Um, it could also be that there's another copy of the application that's on the system that is not patched, but the one that's patched is the one that's actually reporting to your patch management system. Um, so I definitely look into that. Um, and I also encourage uh, you to open a ticket with our support team as well if you are experiencing that. We can definitely look into that, and uh, if there is an issue on our end to be fixed, our our plugins team takes that very, very seriously uh, and will issue a fix. I have seen you know fixes go out very, very quickly for different situations. So, and everyone's Windows environment you know can be slightly different as well. Um, so when you do find things uh, like that, they definitely report them so that we can update uh, our plugins database. Uh, one more question here. How do, how, um, how do you add an MD5 hash to a plugin? Um, there's, we have documentation on this on the web, but Paul, if you could you know, just quickly talk about that one. Yeah, when you are defining your policy uh, inside of the configuration, I can't think it off the top of my head, but there is a spot where you can go in and add an MD5 uh, inside of the policy configuration. Um, if you look in the use, Nessus user guide and uh, you know search for MD5 in there, you'll find it very quickly and there are step-by-step -step instructions right in the user documentation, but the MD5 is added to the scan policy. Um, well, there's there's one with a little tricky for us, but uh, uh, Jim Dolan asks, does Nessus and EI Retina provide the same vulnerability scanning function? So I personally uh, do a fair amount of competitive analysis, and I um, don't say bad things about our competitors. Some of them do great things. Uh, I will say that the entire U.S. Department of Defense used to rely on Retina, uh, formerly, and no longer does. They use Nessus and Security Center. Um, they feel that uh, we provide a, a better product. Obviously, I, uh, I'm biased, but I think we do a, a much more th thorough job as far as things like network equipment, infrastructure equipment, and uh, compliance. Uh, you know, at its core, vulnerability scanning is vulnerability scanning, but uh, obviously, I think we do a better job than, than anyone. And uh, the entire U.S. Department of Defense uh, agrees with me. So. Take that for what it's worth. 
Um, Absolutely. Next, yeah, you know, I, I, I wrote an entire post on how you uh, sometimes when people do a comparison, um, they're leaving out factors that are extremely important when comparing the different vulnerability scanners. You have to make sure you're comparing apples to apples um, and make sure that you understand all of the configuration options that may exist and what your goals are for your vulnerability scanner. Um, and I think that you know, knowing that you'll be able to do an independent comparison very quickly and understand a lot of the differences. And just to kind of harp on what Jack is saying for coverage as well, um, CVE coverage against a, a lot of those uh, other products. Um, I have some data that I can back that up, Jim, if you want to email me uh, separately, um, is considerably stronger inside of uh, Nessus than other products. Um, as well as Jack was saying, you know, our support for devices in terms of configuration, um, configuration auditing and compliance auditing is the most complete against our competition. Um, we can audit things like Huawei routers that we just added support for, or Palo Alto devices, or FireEye. Um, so those are all things inside of your infrastructure that you just wouldn't be able to gain any visibility into with other products. Let's see what else is in here. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think we've answered Jim's question about what separates the two. Um, I, there's just, as Paul said, there there are a lot of things. If you want more specific details, we'll follow it up offline. Like I said, it's, we're happy to uh, tell you why we think uh, it's better, but rather than take up time here on a specific competitive mm -hmm. product, we can drill a little bit more. Uh, Justin asks if there's a guide for comprehensive vulnerability and patch level scanning for Oracle. Uh, in the user guide and in the uh, compliance manuals, there is database, guidance for databases um, as far as a specific document on Oracle by itself. I don't believe there is, you know, dedicated to Oracle, but uh, it is one of the databases that we do have uh, compliance and configuration um, audit policies for that we can uh, help you uh, help you find those. If uh, if you'd like, uh, you can ping us directly and uh, we'll find the resources for you. Um, for me, it's jdaniel at tenable.com or paul at nessus.org. Uh, Jerry had a question about uh, what direction products are going, you know, we're headed uh, moving forward, further enhancements. Uh, we, um, uh, this is <laughs> it's not a roadmap uh, session and we're actually uh, formalizing updated roadmap, the teams are working on that, so we can't really say much there other than there's a bunch of cool stuff coming that I wish they'd let Paul and I talk about, but uh, we uh, need to uh, just uh, let you, leave you uh, sitting and, and waiting. For those of you that uh, might be at DerbyCon uh, in a few weeks, uh, if you join Paul and I and uh, some of the other crew, you'll get a little bit of that information, so there's a teaser for you. Uh, there's also a question. The, uh, Nessus, uh, the Nessus product manager uh, will actually be there to deliver uh, roadmap information at our user group meeting, so I'm very excited about that. Um, let's see. There was a question um, about comparing Nessus with Qualis Guard. Again, that's one. Uh, we, if we're going to go to specific products, again, what uh, Paul has said about uh, the general comparisons apply. If you need specific information, uh, let's take that offline rather than uh, have everybody go into that. Uh, does PBS run off of port monitors only, or can it be firewall connection or VLAN traffic? So PBS will tell you whatever it sees and hears. Uh, so it, if it's on a, uh, if you drop it on a tap, if you put it on a span port, if you're, you know, a monitoring port, uh, it'll tell you that. If you install PBS to listen on an interface that's an active interface, uh, this can be useful for some creative uses of PBS, such as if you're doing fuzzing um, or penetration testing or scanning of a network and you want to use a lightweight scanner, you can put PBS on your host and it'll watch all of the traffic that comes and goes and it'll create a log of that. It's a little less versatile, it's a much more targeted uh, use, uh, but some people do that. It's also interesting to put in in directly on an interface for some servers for the same reason, to, to get a deeper look at everything that's happening on a specific device. Uh, you know, the typical model is, though, to install it, you know, on a tap or span or, you know, some sort of, of traffic repeater port. 
Uh, and so it'll pick up traffic you know, on VLAN. The only issue I know of is if you do VLANs the way everyone tells you not to and have VLANs inside of VLANs inside of VLANs, uh, that's not going to play well, but very few things can unwind multiple layers of VLANs, um, including half your switch gear, uh, in my experience. Uh, one more here from, uh, one from Walter. Is Nessus proper for consulting industries involving scanning vulnerabilities in industry, industry equipment connected to the network? Um, so industrial control and uh, SCADA things. Uh, Paul, you've uh, got some background in uh, working with folks that specialize in industrial control and SCADA. How would you like to answer that one for Walter? Um, uh, the short answer is yes, and there I have an entire 50-minute presentation on that. Um, the highlights are PVS is extremely effective at identifying vulnerabilities in control systems and SCADA devices, uh, as it's that passive monitor and can do it without causing any kind of negative reaction to some of that equipment, which tends to be very sensitive. Um, there are a lot of different manufacturers who produce devices that are more than happy to accept a Nessus scan, and there's a whole family of SCADA plugins, uh, as well as support for Modbus uh, that is built inside of Nessus. It's been there for a really long time, and I've done some intensive scanning of those devices in various settings uh, with great results. Um, in, in fact, results I could share with you. If you want to, Walter, contact me offline, I can give you some uh, some sample scans that I did uh, in a lab setting. And I can say that Tenable is, is dedicated to supporting, um, you know, the ICS uh, industry um, and as well as different kinds of scanned devices. Very good. Let me roll back through the questions, but uh, it looks like we're winding down on time and maybe uh, you want to wrap things up, Paul? Yeah, sounds great, Jack. Thank you very much for moderating questions. Thanks, everyone, so much for attending um, and asking very thought-provoking questions. Uh, we very much appreciate it, and uh, we hope to see everyone on the next webcast. Thanks, everyone.